is a managing director at Two Sigma Investments where he works on tools, infrastructure, and methodologies for quantitative financial research. He's talking about the 1965 issue of the Computer Journal. Hi, everyone. So it's a little bit of a departure for papers we love because I'm presenting a whole journal. Don't worry. I'm going to do it in 15 minutes. We'll get out of here. Um, so yes, the January 1965 issue of the Computer Journal why this issue uh, will tell the story, um, it's fun. So it started with this paper, a simplex method for function minimization. So this is by uh, these two guys, Nelder and Mead. It's often called, called the Nelder-Mead algorithm. Um, and what it is, is it's an algorithm for solving this problem. Um, by the way, I'm sort of a computer scientist, but I'm the kind that plays with computers, for sure. Like, <laughs> but a lot of the people in here are computer scientists who did work uh, later on. All right, so it tries to solve this problem. Uh, we've got a function, f, and it takes some input, and we want to find the inputs that minimize the output of the function. And we know nothing about the function. We don't know its derivative. Um, we may not even know what the formula for it is, but we have some way of evaluating it. So we want to find either the minimum, or if you want the maximum, you could just multiply by negative one. It's the same thing. Um, this problem crops up everywhere. And if you come to my talk on Wednesday, I will be talking about modern solutions to this problem and cover all of the ways in which it is applicable to people at QCon. Um, so this paper is, uh, I had never actually read it until I was preparing my talk. Um, and I was surprised to see that it was just this short six page paper. Uh, we're not gonna read the whole thing, but it, uh, the first two pages cover the whole algorithm, and it's actually a pretty simple algorithm. There's no pseudocode in it. This is from 1965, before pseudocode was really a thing. Um, but they did have this pretty picture um, showing the algorithm. And the thing that I love the most about this is that the, the lines are clearly hand-drawn, so it gives you like this visceral connection to the authors. Um, so that was, that's special for me. Um, and, but it's really a shame that it's presented this way or if it was presented in pseudocode because it's really a visual algorithm. Sorry, don't read that. I see somebody squinting. Don't, don't read that. Um, so the way that this algorithm works is it, it's trying to find a point that, that minimizes a function. And it does this using what's called a simplex. A simplex is a fancy way of saying triangle. Um, <laughs> more, more generally, um, in n dimensions, if n plus one points where no three of them are in a line, it's a, that's a simplex. So in one dimension, it's just a line segment. In two dimensions, it's a triangle. In three dimensions, it's a pyramid or a tetrahedron, if you're fancy. Um, in four dimensions, I don't know what it's called. It's like a color pyramid or a whatever, I don't know. Time pyramid, um, depending on your form of synesthesia. But the way that it works is best illustrated in two dimensions. Uh, we pick three points, and we evaluate the function at those three points. And then what we do is we see which one is the worst. So let's say that this is the worst. The intuition here is we've got these other two points that are pretty good, and this one point that's bad. So we think that this side, this side of those two points is bad, so the natural thing to do is try the other side. So what we do is we do what's called a reflect. And we look at, uh, we reflect that point about the center of the other two points. And we evaluate this new point. And now there are three things that could happen. Either this new point is the best, the worst, or in the middle. Um, if it's in the middle, what we do is we just use this triangle, we just recurse using this triangle. Um, if it's the best, we say, that direction was pretty good. It move, we moved from the red one to the green one, and things got better. Let's keep going. So we do what's called an expand. Um, if that one's the best, now we use this now new expanded triangle and recurse using that. Um, if it's not, we don't. Um, and if this point is the worst, then 
everything sucks as we get further away from those, those two white points. So what we do is we just get closer to them and we do a contract. And that's the entirety of the algorithm. Uh, we just have these three things. We have reflect, expand, and contract as our three options. And it ends up looking really cool when you animate it. You get this triangle that you keep updating and it flops around um, and eventually converges on the optimum point. Uh, sometimes people call this algorithm the amoeba method because they think this looks like an amoeba. I think th that's fun, but I think Neldermead is more fun to say. So I called it Neldermead. Um, all right. There's this great gem in, at the end of the paper where they say that um, it contains fewer than 350 instructions on the Orion machine. That's without final printing because you don't want to skew your, uh, your code golf results um, with printing the results. Um, and it's all addition, subtraction, multiplication. There's no division, because division is expensive. Um, and copies of the routine written in extended Mercury autocode are available from the authors. So it's open source. Uh, <laughs> reproducible research in 1965. It's pretty awesome. Um, and these two things, I think, contribute to this being one of the most cited papers of all time. Uh, this algorithm is, to this day, the default uh, optimization algorithm in a bunch of math packages. Uh, it's been cited over 24,000 times. Um, so that's, that's kind of a big deal. So it's a good, good choice for papers we love. I said before that it was six pages. I lied. It's actually five and a half pages. And I was reading this paper, and I got to the end, and I saw this part, which was a letter to the editor from this. <laughs> called uh, An Impossible Program, and it was by this guy, Christopher Strachey, who is a really influential computer scientist, did a ton of things. He's the guy who coined the term currying. Um, he didn't invent currying, but, but he coined the term. Um, he was a total badass. Um, he was also gay and was uh, persecuted a bit for that, and it's, um, similar to, to Alan Turing, and they were actually contemporaries. And um, there's some, it's a sad story. But um, he was friends with Alan Turing, and he wrote this letter about this time that he was riding the train with Alan, and uh, no big deal. And Alan Turing uh, explained, was explaining the halting problem to him and the proof for it. And Christopher Strait, he realized that he hadn't seen it published anywhere. And this is like a, a big deal. So he's like, oh, I'll just write this letter to the editor. So as far as I know, this is the first time that the proof of the uh, halting problem was, was like widely disseminated. Um, the, the proof is there on the right side. So you just assume that you have something that can take a program and determine whether or not it halts. You call that T. And then you construct this program that has a contradiction where uh, it consumes itself, it's a little weird, um, and it loops, and it continues looping if not t, and halts if t, or whichever the right way is to make the proof, um, sorry. Uh, and that's right here. So I was like, whoa, what is this journal that this was in? Because this, we don't see stuff like this together right now. Like, this is not how it works. You don't have deep numerical methods and deep theoretical computer science about the halting problem in the same journal. Uh, so it sparked my interest. It was like, what else is in here? So that's what we're going to run through really quickly. Um, fortunately, everything in this journal is available online. And I'm just going to do a quick tour of it. Here's the cover. It's beautiful. Uh, this is the British Computer Science, Computer, science, computer Society uh, was the publisher. Uh, it's great because the ads are in here. So like, that's where I want to start because it's fun. Uh, there was an ad from National Cash Registers for their new language H, um, which they, uh, at, as genuinely machine independent as COBOL. Uh, unfortunately, their advertising budget wasn't enough. The language failed. It's not even listed on like the Wikipedia page of all programming languages ever. So. <laughs> Sad. Um, you got your tape punch machines. There's like this beast here, this big one, that can do 300 characters per second. Um, 
you've got your Mad Men executives making decisions about air conditioning um, for their computer room. It's these three dudes here in the computer room, and it's labeled computer room, <laughs> period, in case you were wondering what a computer room looked like back then. Job ads, ready for action programmer. This is what they used to call rock stars and ninjas. <laughs> um, and uh, central vacuuming for keeping your computer room dust free. Now, it's not funny. Unfortunately, these are the only women that were in this journal. And that's, it was kind of striking. So I was reading through it. I read the whole thing, because I have problems. Um, and they have the notes on the submission of papers here. So if you want your paper in the computer journal, here's what you've got to do. And there was this section that, that jumped out at me, which is that authors' names should be given without title or degree. Uh, women are requested to give one Christian name in full to avoid confusion. Now, this was, this was confusing to me. Um, well, there, so that's great. They accepted publications from, from women. Um, a Christian name, for those of you who don't know, that's the non-intersectional way of saying first name. Um, and it, when, I, when I presented this before, somebody explained to me why this was. And it was because the custom at the time was for, peop was for women to submit uh, using their husband's name, but like Mrs. Some Dude um, as, as the thing. So because they didn't say Mr. or Mrs. in here to avoid confusion. They didn't want people to just submit with their husband's name. So they, this was actually like sort of progressive, I guess. Um, yeah. All right. So on to some of the papers. I'm just going to look really quickly, really quickly at three of the papers that were in here. Uh, the first one that jumped out at me was this one, A Basic Approach to Pattern Recognition by J.R. Ullman. I got really excited because J. Ullman is like this famous dude Right, Hopcroft and Ullman, he wrote the Dragon Book, which is like the compiler's book. He wrote all these Automata book. There's like nodding of recognition. This is not that Jay Ullman. <laughs> uh, uh, so this is the other Jay Ullman. Um, but it was still a cool paper. And uh, it's about this data structure that he had constructed um, for use in this pattern recognition algorithm. And the example that they give in here uh, of where you would apply this is for what they call pattern recognition, but it was actually uh, for when you have a grid of ones and zeros where the ones represent black pixels and the zeros represent white pixels, and you want to identify digits, handwritten digits. So this is like the MNIST problem. This is the, you know, recognizing handwritten digits to this day is still like the first, uh, you know, it's like the hello world of machine learning. Um, and I did not know that, it, that people were working on this in 1965. So that was cool. Um, the next one that jumped out at me was this one called Lists and Why They Are Useful. Um, 10 years ago, everything was just about numerical problems. But now, we're concerned about things other than numbers. So in this paper, uh, he presents linked lists. Now, the author of this is uh, Morris Wilkes, who um, is he's a Turing Award winner. He's kind of a big deal. Um, he built the first computer with stored memory. Um, so that's cool. Um, I hadn't heard of him before this, but um, an ignoramus. Um, in this paper, he presents linked lists. And then goes on to give, as, as an example for like learning linked lists, how to represent symbolic equations with it. And then he has this list program for computing the first derivative of a symbolic equation. So this is what he thought was a good you know, intro to linked lists. Uh, this, is, this is how I learned it in, in you know, Data Structures 101. Um, there's a great note in there. Uh, accompanying the list program where he like says uh, he, he apologizes and just like gives his one note that the parens you could just treat them as begin and end statements um, and that's his uh, intro to lisp <laughs> all right and then to wrap it up there's this other one what is the use of operating systems this was my favorite and I actually recommend that everybody read this paper um, there is a uh, there is a bunch in here, and it was really interesting because it's presented 
uh, to a different audience. I, like when I learned about operating systems, it was like here's this, kind, here's this operating system, here's that operating system, here are the differences. This was presenting it from why do you need, like you've been using the bare metal, why do you want, an oper why do you want to incur the costs of an operating system on top of that? Which is a really interesting perspective. Um, and there are a lot of gems in here. He covers so many things about operating systems, um, like interrupts and virtual memory and like using file descriptors to represent things other than files and a lot more. Uh, what was really striking about it was that there are so many parallels to, uh, in here to what we've encountered over the last like decade around distributed systems um, where we've, before we were kind of using distributed, we were using the bare metal of distributed systems and weren't really principled in how to organize things. And then we've seen these things like uh, Mesos and Kubernetes be introduced that are like operating systems for your distributed system. And the justifications for it are all pretty much the same as the things that he lays out in here. So that was cool. You should check this one out. Uh, and then just closing thought, I'll close with the closing statement from that paper. It is hoped that it will not take too long for the economic situation to allow us to put man's time at a higher premium than that of a machine. Um, so that's the Computer Journal. Thank you for your time. I'll see you at the bar.